Introducing Portraits and Ideas. I'm Earl Ernest Gow, presenting interviews to inspire and perhaps unveil something new in the realm of ideas. So, your name is? Well, I'm Richard Miller. And you are? A professor, professor of pathology at the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So, what advice would you give to youth to promote their interest in pursuing science careers? Well, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I can describe my own experience. Even when I was quite young, like in junior high school and in high school, I was really interested in scientific questions. I had a lot of questions um, that had not been answered and for which I wanted the answer, so it, uh, it seemed to me that it would be a fun thing to work in a scientific laboratory coming up with questions and trying to work out ways to solve them. Um, it's lucky for me that I live uh, at a time and a place where you can have a career doing that because um, right now and you know for all of my career I've been uh, I've had a job that allowed me to do science come up with experiments publish papers teach other people now that I'm more senior uh, um, and those are things that I enjoy a great deal uh, so being able to do them not as a hobby but as a job has been a real a real uh, lucky break for me so that actually leads to the next question is, how did you reach the position you are in today in your profession? Sort of please outline your career and explain the milestones and the educational advancement to the PhD. Well, I, I knew very early from the time I was probably in my early teens, I wanted to be a professional scientist. So in high school, I took a lot of science courses and some math courses. In college, I specialized in biology and chemistry. I went to a college which was um, had a good reputation for getting people ready for graduate school or for medical school. When I was ready to leave college, I had to decide whether I wanted to get a PhD degree or both an MD and a PhD degree, and for a variety of reasons, I decided to get both degrees. After, uh, uh, most people, after they get an MD and a PhD, want to do some clinical work, but I never really had any interest in clinical work. So right after I graduated uh, uh, with the degrees, I went into postdoctoral research. I did uh, postdocs in two places and, and tried in each case to learn some stuff that I had not known as part of my PhD thesis, trying to sort of e expand my horizons and my professional competence. And when I was ready to start setting up a laboratory of my own, um, I met uh, the man who was the chairman of pathology at Boston University. He liked me, I liked him, he had a job op opening, I liked Boston, and so he offered me a job and I set up a lab of my own. When you're doing that at the very beginning of your career, the key elements are uh, having ideas that are creative enough that you're going to get some grant support because nowadays, at least in the United States, unless you're able to compete successfully for grants in your own name, your career does not, not do particularly well. And once um, I had some grants of my own and a laboratory of my own, then it made my lab an attractive place for graduate students to seek a PhD and for uh, MDs and PhDs to start thinking about postdoctoral research. The, the best labs are the ones where you're bringing in smart people with good new ideas and a good um, sense of, uh, of discipline and a desire to get ahead. Uh, nobody nowadays can do all of this on their own. My lab thrives in large part because I've been lucky enough to attract uh, good students who have most of them done a really good job. So, so name the institution that you just mentioned about the undergraduate as well as medical school. I got my undergraduate degree at Haverford College, which is a small college, uh, Quaker college outside of uh, Philadelphia. Haverford, Bryn Mawr, and Swarthmore were founded by Quakers in the 18, uh, or mid 1800s. Then I got my MD and PhD at Yale, and when I was ready to do postdoctoral work. My first, first postdoc, which did not go well, was at Harvard and, uh, and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And then uh, my second, which was more productive and more pleasant and more successful, was at Sloan Kettering uh, Institute in New York City. And then I took my first job at Boston University. I stayed there for eight years. My wife was uh, a, an assistant professor at Harvard uh, in English, and Harvard had never tenured a woman in English, ever. They had no official policy against tenuring women, but just by coincidence, they had never done it. So when Patsy got a good offer uh, to take a tenured position at the University of Michigan, uh, we both left for Michigan. Michigan was a, has a terrific medical school, and they have always been very strong in aging research, which was my own main interest. So we moved together, and we stayed there um, 
from 1990. What was the <clears throat> childhood stimulus? You alluded to that a little bit earlier. What was the childhood stimulus to becoming a scientist? You know, and also you can speak to say other scientists that were inspirations for you. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I I think. My hunch, and it's only a hunch because I really haven't read a lot of scientific biographies or talked to a lot of scientists. My hunch is that the key thing is a desire to ask uh, interesting questions. The, the thing that makes a, a difference between a good scientist and a, a, just a so-so scientist is not really exactly you know, how hard they work or how smart they are or how good they are at, at uh, writing up their results. What really counts is their being able to discriminate problems that are interesting and solvable from problems that are either uninteresting or, or not solvable. Um, any really good scientist will have five or ten kind of cool sounding ideas every year and you can't possibly try to run off in ten different directions at the same time. So my, my guess is that the critical element in becoming a really successful scientist is being able to say no to ideas that are sort of okay. Marginal. Marginal. marginal are either there. Mm -hmm. The methods are not ready to solve them yet, or they're they're solvable, but they just won't bring the field uh, far enough in advance. You have to be able to, of course, work hard, study hard, have a pretty good memory for facts, be able to work with others, right. uh, and also have a decent head for um, critical thinking. There, there, there are a lot of people who are sort of in semi-scientific positions that are just full in love with their own ideas and are not willing to say, you know, I got that one wrong. Uh, the ability to look at your own data and say, you know, that was a reasonably good guess, but it's not the right guess. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's a really important thing that you can waste your life. So pursuing a fixed idea that um, you're fond of but turns out to be wrong and most people recognize it's wrong. So you actually went to the next question. What, how would you describe these study approaches that you took? Because obviously a lot of students, <clears throat> they will start out trying to be scientists, but they give up because of difficulty that they encounter. So, so how did you uh, deal with that sort of uh, developing the skill sets that would, you know, made your career progress? A lot of it is perseverance. I mean, uh, almost everybody at not just one, but many points in their career will spend a year or two working on something that doesn't work. The methods fail, or uh, it was just a bad idea, or it turned out to be much more complicated than you had originally thought it might be. And you get to the point where you, you say, you know, I could spend another six months, I could spend another 12 months running this to the ground, but I've already spent a year or two on it, I've got to say no and start something else. That's a really hard thing to ask anybody to do or to ask yourself to do. But if you can't do that, you'll wind up taking false leads and sort of pursuing them and wasting a lot of time doing that. So I'm sure like when you were at Harvard, Harvard you ran into difficult math courses, for example, or even some of the uh, advanced biology courses. Yeah. I, I have a little experience with that myself. Yeah. Uh, how did you get past those obstacles that you encountered? You, know, you mentioned persistence, but right. were, were there some techniques in that persistence that you deployed? I think each person has different sets of skills and you need to find a specific set of research problems where your skills are a good match. Um, I have enough math ability to get reasonably good grades in sort of a first year or two of college math and after that I get hopelessly lost. And so I wanted to find research problems that did not require uh, advanced math skills. Unfortunately there are a lot of exciting things. I, I'm, I've always been interested in aging research. And there are a lot of important problems in aging research that you can tackle without advanced skills in math or physics or chemistry. I mean, I knew enough of those uh, kinds of science that I, uh, I can listen to talks in those areas. The other thing that really counts is the ability when you get, you find that something is over your head to be able to pick up the phone to someone who knows what they're talking about and say, I got a problem, I can't solve it. Maybe we could collaborate. That's that's a really important skill. There are an awful lot of people who know more than I do about uh, nearly everything of importance, but I'm not shy about asking them for help when help appears to be useful. So that actually, so so, what other obstacles did you encounter during the course of your developing your right. PA, getting to a PhD, MD, which is a very, how should we say, 
it's, it's not a common occurrence that a person gets right. multiple degrees like that. And, and, and when you encounter these obstacles, what was your approach toward them, you know, from a psychological as well as a practical point of view? Well, for me, when I was pursuing my PhD degree, I started out with a project I thought would be exciting. And I worked on it for about a year, and I made a lot of different cell lines that grew in tissue culture that I thought were an important step towards solving the problem. And then I had to go home for a holiday vacation. So I took the cell lines, I froze them in liquid nitrogen so that they would survive over the holidays. When I came back from the holidays, they were all dead. So i would lost pretty much a year of, of effort, and there's nothing that you can do about that except be willing either to start over or to pick a related and different problem, and I, I started over at the time. With the same, the same project? Uh, pretty much the same project, but a, with a slight variation, yeah. And learning from your initial failure yeah. in, in terms of, I guess it was ice that formed in the cell lines, and that's one of the problems with cryogenics. It isn't and, quite uh, clear. Yeah. I mean, I had, I'm, I'm no dummy. I had frozen them down and then thawed and aliquoted each out to make sure they were okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just going to dump them and then run away from them and hoping for the best. I tested them and something must have happened during the holiday to uh, make them not be viable cells anymore because when I got back none of them would, none of them would, would wake up again. It was very embarrassing. Um, <clears throat> what is the most significant breakthroughs in science do you predict over the next 10 25, 50 years, uh, do you have any perspective on that? Because this might always, you know, give a tip to a, a student as to what they might want to pursue. That's too broad a question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in part because there are a hundred different kinds of science, each one of which is going to have a couple of breakthroughs, and I don't know enough Okay, so let's focus, let's focus on aging, which yeah. is the area. And, you know, actually, let's get into why did you choose aging, and so, and then you can lead into what you think might be breakthroughs. In well, aging. I chose aging for, you know, pretty much the obvious reason. Aging is really bad for you. Um, if you gave someone a choice whether they would like to be about 30, or whether they would like to be like today's average 80 or 90 year old, very few people would say, you know, I, I'd feel better if I were aging today <laughs> rather than 30. So aging is really rotten for you, and so I'm against it. And I think ways to slow the aging process have the, the benefit, potential benefit of helping to keep people happy and healthy for a long time. Um, I believed then, and it's still true, that I think 99% of biological scientists and people who spend money, government money and private money on biological sciences, underestimate how important aging research could be. Some people say, I'm going to work on AIDS, I'm going to work on Alzheimer's, I'm going to work on cancer, I'm going to work on diabetes. And these are people with, you know, very good will, they're experts, they're doing a good job. But they're, they don't understand that the working on aging has more of a potential to really slow down and prevent those diseases than disease-specific work. And that's one of the things that, that I um, believed or understood, depending on how confident you want me to sound. I either believed it early on or understood it early on, uh, which is still a minority viewpoint or a minority understanding. That made, it, that made a big difference. The other thing that's attractive about aging biology for scientists is that there are, um, there are so few people working on it that even one person can make some impact. And also, it's a mystery. You know, I, I mean a mystery in the sense that um, infectious disease was a mystery about 400 years ago. 400 years ago, before people knew about germs uh, and bacteria, there were a wide range of theories as to why someone got this disease where they coughed all the time. And some people said it was a God striking them down, or they breathed in bad air, or they had you know, committed a crime of some sort. Only after the discovery of germs did it become clear that all productive research was going to have to be based upon the germ idea. That idea was correct, and to study infection, you really had to reject all the other ideas. Rather than divine retribution. Yes, right, for example. Or, or, or foul-smelling air or something exactly. like that. Yeah. No. Um, so aging is still a mystery in the sense that infectious disease was a mystery 400 years ago. There are now some pretty good ideas about what controls the rate of aging five or 10 or 15 good ideas, 
And any one of them could be true, as far as I can tell. There's some people who say that I believe it's mutations, or some people say I believe it's mitochondria, or some people that say I believe it's changes in the brain. And any one of those, or any two or three of them, could be right. So it's a great scientific challenge, a field that doesn't have a lot of <coughs> brilliant people already working in it, so you can make an impact if, you're, if you work hard at it. Yeah, you know, the, the conclusion that you came early on about focusing on longevity rather than specific diseases is something that I came to that same conclusion. I say, well, how is it that the entire medical establishment of, have not come to that conclusion? I mean, is there any explanation for that? Is that because of group think, dogmatic thinking about what has come from years past? Well, there's a whole variety of, mm -hmm. of things that contribute. Part of the reason why aging research is held in bad repute is that there are an awful lot of charlatans who want to sell you products that they say are going to stop aging and they're not making it up. They're doing it for profit. They're frauds. Yeah. And they're, these people outnumber greatly by a factor of 10 to 1 serious scientists who are working on aging. So if you, if you ask somebody, um, you know, Snake oil. I work on aging, they say, oh, I know that sort of person. I don't, that, that's someone that you would never, never trust. So that, puts aging research into a bad light, and being disassociating aging from charlatans is an important thing to do. The, the other reason why, uh, an, another big reason why um, aging researchers are hard to find is that the money, uh, scientists know that they got to get paid, they got to get grants. And the way the NIH is set up, and private foundations and drug companies are set up, they want to pick a disease, they want to pick cancer, or diabetes, or Alzheimer's, or eye disease, or leukemia, or whatever, and then go after that. Um, so s researchers who are smart, who are ambitious, want to get a grant, want to set up their lab, they try to find a field that they know is well-funded. Right. And basic science analyses of aging is not well-funded. I, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, I looked at a batch of grants to sort of guess what fraction of money was going into that. And of every um, $100 that NIH spends, six cents go into the basic biology of aging. Yeah. And scientists know this. They don't want to go into an area where, where the money is just not, uh, it's just uh, not The paucity of funding. And, 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 and so that, they, you know, that's, that speaks to the point that you made earlier that by focusing on aging, which is a broad focus, yeah. you have a huge potential for the spillover effect to actually deal with all the other diseases that are being well funded, you know. Well, this get, I think this is true, but it also gets at a third reason why um, there, so much money is spent on specific diseases. There are powerful people, scientists, deans, department chairs, institute directors, whose whole career has been built upon turf defense. If you are in charge of the Alzheimer's Institute and somebody says, you know, I think maybe we should cut the budget for Alzheimer's by 5% and spend it on basic science. That's, you view that is terribly threatening. And I, I, I picked Alzheimer's sure, as sure. one example, but it's true for the cancer biologists and the lung biologists and the ear, ear biologists. Everybody is, feels very, they're under, underfunded and they know it. And exactly. they feel, anyone that says, some of your money should go into funding my stuff as a major threat. They don't want that. That's right. And they're That's very right. well placed. That's right. It's a, a zero-sum game. Kind of. Yeah. And so you have the, you know, the whole thing. Maybe it's a question of how it's described. When you say aging, that has kind of a negative connotation. But if you say longevity, that has a little more positive connotation. But but those are just things that could, uh, you know, influence it. But do you see that trend changing now in terms of the fact that there's a there's a pivot point now where money is coming into longevity and aging. I think it, is, it has been changing very slowly mm -hmm. for the last 10 or 20 years. Um, now there have been discoveries since about the mid-90s that have made aging research more productive and have gotten us further uh, along the path mm -hmm. to understanding what's going on. We have much better tools now in terms of animal models, for example, um, uh, that are allowing basic scientists working in aging to make progress. And some of this has begun to trickle up to public consciousness. If you, mm -hmm. you know, once or twice a year there'll be a program on NOVA. Yeah, yeah. They Way to talk about time it. to discussing serious anti-aging uh, anti right. science. Right. Right. There was a big article in the New York Times just this week from Amy Harbin talking about this. Mm -hmm. 
when you're writing a newspaper article or a magazine article or you are doing a TV show, you sort of have to find something to pitch to your editor. So yeah, it has right. to be something kind of cute and novel. That's right, uh, that's right. So they're always looking for an angle. But, but the number of articles that accurately portray the excitement of aging research has gone up dramatically in the last 10 or 20 years, and that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. you, you can tell it's a good sign when really big companies like Google, for instance, feel it's appropriate to start putting some money into aging research. They've formed this so thing called Calico. Yeah, Cal Calico, yeah, and, I've um, seen that. It's not, it's not yet clear whether Cal, what Calico is going to do. They're That's very right. closed mouth, but yeah. it's, I think, a good sign. Cynthia Kinden is on the board, I think. She is yeah. their vice president for That's research. Right. That's right. correct. Right. Uh, and what about the metformin trial? That's a sort of a breakthrough as well, right? Or not relevant? It's a breakthrough politically. Whether it's going to become a breakthrough scientifically is mm -hmm. uncertain. Um, there's a batch of researchers. Yeah, many, you were mentioning many of them. Meaning that metformin is not a proven you know, extender of lifespan. Well, let me let me just sort of go over the basis of this. Um, there's a batch of researchers who are interested in getting governmental approval for a clinical trial in which they would evaluate some drug on people and get an idea as to whether the drug given to middle-aged people is going to slow the aging process. And the FDA has a rule, you cannot request permission for a drug that slows aging. It's just the law. So what these folks are doing, and this is very smart, is saying, okay, to the FDA, not going to slow aging, but what if we say we have a drug that we think might slow down five or six important diseases at the same time? And the FDA hasn't said yes yet, but they have said they're kind of listening to that. So these, these group, this group of scientists, had to pick a specific drug that they want to use as the initial drug for these trials, and they picked metformin. And I think that's a canny choice, a pretty good choice, in part because metformin, which is a very safe used diabetes drug, is very for safe. For many years, yeah. And all the, the evidence that it actually would slow aging is spotty. There's, there are two mouse trials, one from my lab and the ITP, one from NIH, they both show very small effects. In one case, it was not statistically significant. In the other case, it might or might not be, depending on how you look at the data. There's the human trials uh, are all in diabetics, so they don't, you don't know if they're going to work in people. But there's, it's not silly to think it might work. And so I really think these guys are on, the, um, on a good path. They, I think they open the door. Yeah, I think they're, they're opening a door. Mm -hmm. I don't think metformin is likely to be the best drug for aging or the last one to be tried, but I think they have a combination of scientific and sort of science slash politics uh, uh, ideas that are pushing them in this direction and I wish them well. I think it's a You mentioned issue. four in your lecture, so right. those are also potential down the pike. Not elite, maybe rapamycin is not one of them, but the other three. Well, have. The, the principle for the mouse studies, the interventions, testing program studies in mice, the principle is important, more important, I think, even than the individual drugs. The principle is two things, establishing that drugs can slow the aging process and postpone multiple diseases, and by postponing multiple diseases, extend healthy lifespan. I think the more people come to understand that, the more interest there will be in interventional sure. aging research. Sure. And the other reason that these studies are important is each time you get a winner, a drug that's a winner, it opens up new ideas for not just our lab, but for dozens of labs. Yeah. You know, the rapamycin paper, which was the first uh, paper with, it was a publication in Nature of a drug that slowed aging and extended lifespan. That was in 2009, and since then, dozens of other labs have reproduced the work and extended it, and they're starting to think about whether it might be helpful in humans in certain situations. I personally think rapamycin is not a drug that is going to find widespread applicability in people. I think that it has too many side effects. Right. But it's a reasonable idea that you could design drugs that are similar to rapamycin in the specific cellular processes that they target, which would be safer. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that you would find, we're trying this now in mice, a way to give little tiny bits of rapamycin every now and then in ways that might accomplish some good stuff with fewer side effects. The other three drugs that, that uh, the Interventions Testing Program has developed, each one of them 
is a sort of a lead class. One of them has to do with glucose, one of them has to do with steroids, one of them has to do with inflammation. And um, it may well be that other drugs that target those areas will prove to be uh, potent and maybe even eventually find their way into human clinical trials or human pre preventive medicine. Okay, you've gotten into it quite a bit, but let's backtrack a bit. Sort of explain your line of research for a lay audience in terms of what, what your goals are and how you are trying to accomplish those goals. Well, in briefly. <laughs> you know, I mean, in the broadest sense, what my lab tries to do is to learn more about uh, what times the process of aging and to use that information to develop drugs that can slow the process down. Um, it's, it's immediately obvious to everybody that aging can occur quickly or slowly. It occurs very quickly in a mouse, somewhere in the middle for dogs, more slowly in chimps, slower still in us, and even slower in whales. So aging does the same sorts of things. It ruins your heart, it ruins your eyes, it ruins your brain, it ruins your muscles, it ruins your everything. But it can occur either very slowly or moderately slowly or very quickly, depending on what species you are. Uh, within dogs, it depends on what breed. So what we're trying to do now is figure out how we can grab a hold of those controls and slow the whole aging process down. To, to get into that, we have several different kinds of slow aging mice. Some of them are mutants, some have drug treatments, some have diet treatments. And what we are trying to do is figure out how these overlap, because if we can find specific hormone changes or cell changes or brain changes that are changed in the same direction whenever you've got a slow aging mouse or a slow aging person, that will give us a hint that seeking drugs that could accomplish that for most ordinary people might might benefit from targeting that My specific. Medics. Well, I don't know that they're going to mimic exactly all the things of cow restriction. So I don't like myself personally so the use of the term mimetics. What I want to do is find enough out about how each of these different kinds of interventions slows aging so that I can see which pathways, shared pathways, are the most promising for drug development. So what breakthrough and when do you expect it to occur? I mean, in terms of your projection or forecast? Yeah, yeah there's no way to answer that. Unfortunately, it, it, you know, if do you see the research based on your colleagues and your community of, I would say, longevity researchers? Right. Do you see a consensus building as to kind of a geometric increase in the, in the data and, and, and just the knowledge of, of, the, of, of understanding the aging process that would lead to a breakthrough, say, in, in the near term, say, say five to ten years? in terms of a, a, a pretty comprehensive understanding of the aging process and how we can intervene and you know, effectively influence it, as you say, slowing it down or even perhaps reversing it. No. Okay. Simple as that, right? So that, that's just a kind of a mystery in the community and everybody's just working, not really thinking that, oh, by this date, I would like to be here. Let me tell you a story. So I was at an aging research meeting, it was about 15, 20 years ago, and there was an, a, a reporter for Life magazine, they were writing a story. And they went up to everybody at the meeting and they said, what is the longest you think people can ever live? And about half of us said, that's not a very good question. <laughs> There's no way to answer that. And some people, some people who wanted it to be quoted in the story said 100 years, 200 years, 500 years. There was a particular scientist who said 600 years. Based upon our work, people will live 600 years. And the story came out, the first sentence in the story was, Dr. So-and-so says that his work will help people live 600 years. So I don't respect Dr. So-and-so. Right, right, and right. since I want to have but some self-respect, I, I don't want to make wild speculations. Right, right. Um, in part, you know, you're asking like, when will people have a new idea that works? And that's not an easy question to ask. It's like asking, when is the next great writer going to appear on the scene? Okay, so, so sort of destroy this idea. Right. Can aging be made, an analog made analogous to, say, a vintage car, vintage car preservation? You know how you just keep replacing the parts, and that vintage car can keep running indefinitely, essentially. Uh, that's a, that's a, an analogy that has some points of attraction and some points that, that don't work out. Um, 
there are parts of the body that are not going to be replaceable. Your brain is not going to be replaceable. No question about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there are parts like your teeth that can be replaced. Right. So um, the car is more like your teeth. It's not like your brain. Okay. So okay. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good way to understand right. it. That there are replaceable parts, but they are non-replaceable parts. Right. Uh, and and the, the problem is that aging doesn't merely represent one part going bad and then another part going bad and then the third part going bad. What's going on in aging, uh, whether it's a short-lived animal or a long-lived animal, is that the body gradually and slowly and progressively loses its ability to fix itself up. And one thing leads to another. So for instance, my, my dad, uh, when he was in his mid-80s, he, uh, he, he left pinochle game, he slipped on the ice, he fell, he broke his hip, okay? And now as it happens, he went into the hospital, they fixed his hip, he had another six or seven productive years of life. But if he were unlucky, when he was in the hospital, he might have gotten an infection and died. Not so so, so yeah. what, is, what, what would have killed him under those circumstances? Well, partially it's the loss of balance, that's why he slipped. Sure. The loss of muscles, that's why he couldn't right himself. Right. The loss of bones, that's why his hip broke. Disorders of judgment, that's why he went out walking on an icy oh, pathway, nice. yeah. followed by a change in the immune system, which is why he didn't... Re a cascade of yeah. effects. Yeah. So yeah. no one of those things was the lethal thing in this hypothetical story. Right. But, but as people get to be 60, 70, 80, 90, they, they begin to, to have lower margins. They have fewer protective systems that can take up the slack. Uh, if if a, a healthy person falls down and breaks a bone, they're pretty good at healing it. If a 90-year-old person falls down and breaks a bone, it takes them a lot longer to heal and there are more complications and maybe they stop exercising because their leg is broken and because of the lack of exercise they have another problem. It just all mounts up because all of the defenses are sort of, uh, if you cut back every defense by 50 or 60 or 70 percent, then you get to a point where something bad is going to lead to something even worse. I'm not down to the last three questions, but but as you point talk about that, just to bring up a point, my my mother who's 98 yeah. fell three days ago yeah. and and fractured, I think two ribs, oh. and so she's now being evaluated, you know, right. uh, because of the post trauma right. potential complications, right. pneumonia, etc. So that's very current in what I'm dealing with, trying to talk to my sister on the phone right. over in South Carolina. Yeah. Okay, so. The next question is, what, what would you consider the greatest achievement you've made so far in your profession? That's a difficult question to answer, in part because it's harder, it, it becomes easier to answer 10 and 20 and 30 years down the road after discovery uh, either is found to be correct, found to be incorrect, or found to be influential. Um, I would have to guess that it's not a specific scientific discovery. I've been very vocal in trying to educate scientists as to the importance of aging research and also to the importance of using paradigms in which you focus your energy and attention on animals that are aging slowly rather than on animals that are quick and easy to study. There are a lot of people who are in a hurry, and they want to, they take mice that are going to die young, and they say, ah, these are aging really fast. I'm going to study them because it's more convenient. I can get results faster. Really fast. And I've been outspoken, and I've hurt some people's feelings uh, by, by stating my belief that fast is not the best thing to go for here. <laughs> the best thing to go for here is something that is really going to be helpful and informative about aging as it really occurs in normal people, not in genetically crippled people, for example. So uh, it's hard for me to guess, because I don't have a lot of outside perspective. I'd be happy if it turned out that my major contribution to aging research was in convincing a lot of people that uh, aging deserved attention as a treatable phenomenon and that um, there are no shortcuts that you actually have to look at aging rather than things that you can pretend are aging. Mm -hmm. There's a, a vast army of people who are studying, quote, aging in tissue culture. You can put cells in culture, they stop dividing after a while. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting, really good cancer biology. 
but for historical quirk. He was referred to as aging in tissue culture for 30 years. And I think that's a shame because mm -hmm. it's not aging. It's nothing really like aging. And a whole generation of really smart people were tricked themselves into saying it's sort of like aging. I'm going to study it. But instead, they could have been studying real aging. So given your deep knowledge of the aging question, how has it informed your way of life and your approach to maintaining your own health? Oh, I'm no better than anyone else at any of that. I mean, everybody knows to sustain good health, you've got to see your doctor, you've got to wear seat belts, you can't possibly smoke, it helps to exercise an awful lot. If you eat mostly ice cream and french fries and get fat, that's not really good for you. I mean, all of these things are true and blatant and not a mystery and people just differ in the degree to which they have the financial and emotional uh, and personality resources to follow that. Um, none of this has anything to do with the biology of aging. It has to do with what's already widely recognized as good health maintenance strategies. Um, if people ask me, as I'm often asked, what is the one thing I can do to try to get to the point where I'm going to live to be 120, I answer, and I'm, it sounds like a joke, but it's completely true. You can call all of your congressmen today and uh, tell them that they should put a lot more money in aging research. The only real chance we have of having a fundamental breakthrough in the biology of aging, that's the only way in which you're going to have a fundamental impact that will radically increase the likelihood of people being healthy and active when they're 90s and when they're 100. So you, do you sort of feel that the, the people here who sort of try to practice color restriction is kind of a fool's errand? No, 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 no. I, I think it, it's very likely that calorie restriction diets for people might well be really good for your health. Uh, and there's no evidence for that, okay, <laughs> or very little evidence for that. But calorie restricted diets are good for most kinds of animals, and people are animals, and it, it may well be really good. What I am saying, though, and I think this is clearly true, is that the kind of mental personality necessary to actually follow rigorously a calorie restricted regime is present in only one person in a thousand, or one person in ten thousand. Um, there's all enormously strong data that nearly everybody was given great motivation to lose weight, can lose some weight and then they gain most of it back or all of it back in the next uh, year or two. There are a few people who keep it off for a while, but they're rare. So the people who actually do, you know, I, I weigh about 180 pounds. If I were on a caloric restricted diet, I'd have to lose 60 pounds and keep it off forever. And anyone who's 180 pounds knows that losing 60 pounds is not going to work for them. They're not going to be able to do it. So caloric restriction is not, it's a really interesting personal strategy for a small number of special people. Mm -hmm. It's a very important tool for studying the biology of aging in people, but as a clinical preventive medicine, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not really fundamental. It would, not, it would very unlikely be a mass adaptation yeah. because the, the key would be, as you say, to focus on the research and, and and develop the medications or the mimetics potentially yes. that might be right. might be the thing that could be massively deployed, like vaccinations, for example. Yeah. So, last couple. Um, if, you, if you have people that you who would like to increase their running speed, okay, right, uh, you can give them excellent advice, which is to take longer steps and more of them. Right, right. Just keep going. Right, right, you know? exactly. And there are a small fraction of people who can convert that into. Uh, you know, two hour and 20 minute marathons. But most of us, no matter how much we tell ourselves to keep on going, it's, it's not going to matter. We're not going to finish the marathon in less than three or four hours, or in my case, six hours. Right, right. So it, it's For not a matter hours. of, I have decided to eat less calories. The body is not, by and large, fashioned to run 26 miles in a little over two hours. And by and large, the body is not fashioned to reduce its caloric intake below 40, uh, 40 by 40% over what you'd like to eat. It just doesn't work that way, regardless of whether you think it is or not. How would you describe a typical day in your profession? So you start up in the morning, and then what do you do in that? You know, I know there's no typical day, but just uh, sort of uh, 
lay out some of the ideas. Because, as I say, a young student will look and say, well, do I want to spend my day doing yeah, what this depends, professor does? It depends does. a lot on where you are in your career and also on what kind of research you do. And okay, say at your career at this point in time, where you, are, where you are a senior professor with a large uh, you know, postdoc right. crew and I have about 15 student. people in the lab. Yeah. So my day, I don't really do research in the sense of going into the lab and taking some blood and testing it for something. I don't do that in, anymore. I did that full time when I was a graduate student and nearly full time when I was a postdoc. And I did a lot of it in my first few years as a professor. But now it's not an efficient use of my time because the other people in the lab are really good at it. Many of them are better at it than I am. But I have skills they don't have. And so I spend most of my day doing things like listening to a graduate student tell me about her research idea and giving her comments that I hope will help improve her pro project. Or I will get a postdoc who has written a grant application and I will have spent the last two days reading it and I will sit down with her and show her how to write better and where data is missing but should be present. I will help give her ideas about how to improve it. And then somebody will ask me, will I please read a paper that's been submitted to a journal and I'll read the paper and I'll tell the journal editors whether I think it's good or bad, and if it's not so good, what, what can be done to improve it. And then I'll spend the next three days writing, um, as I, I've been doing here, I'm, I have to give a course in how to analyze data for our graduate students. So I have to come up with four hours worth of presentations on how that. I noticed that you were, you were working the whole time. Right? When, when, when the talk is exciting, I will pay very careful attention <laughs> to the talk. And when it's something that I already know, or which is nonsense, I will go back to writing my lectures. Right. So it's a, it's a mixture of reading articles, writing articles, writing grants, reading grants, advising students, uh, and a lot of administrative stuff. When you are um, running a lab, you spend a lot of your time dealing with uh, bureaucratic obstacles, getting the animal care committee to approve, our animal, to approve our animal protocols, getting the department chair to consider salary increases for the IRBs, you, do, you, do, you don't, don't have to do it because do, you don't do human, I don't human research. Yeah, right, okay. We have the animal care office that's oh, okay, okay. Uh, about equally difficult. Sure, sure. So, you know, mentioning what you just described, wouldn't you say, how would you place the students you mentor and, and, and teach as, as a high achievement in your career? Well, they come in all shapes and sizes. There are some students who are very talented but have never worked in the lab before. And the goal there is to sort of be patient with them for a year or two until they have a sense of what the lab can do for them and they start to really make progress. There are other students who um, don't have the ability to become a first grade independent scientist of their own. And that's, for me, the most challenging because I don't want to give up on them and I don't want to say sorry you're never going to make it, because that's very discouraging. So I have to sort of do my best to coax them along, even though I'm, I know that at best what they'll be able to do is get a job somewhere in science, but not one that has a leadership or creative responsibility. The, the best people, of course, are the ones that come in, they're going to make it, they're really smart, they're creative, they're very hardworking. Often I can help them some by giving them different perspective on their work, giving them an outside you know, sounding board to talk about their ideas. Um, sometimes even really smart, hardworking, bright, well-educated people will not be good at saying no to themselves. That is, they'll have so many ideas they want to try them all. And there, my goal is to say, you know, you really can't. Tamp even though tamp you it are down. very tamp good, <laughs> you can't do all of those things. Right, right. Let's pick two to start with. Right? Right, right. When you have some momentum built, then we'll, we'll discuss the next one. Right. And some people are good at hearing that message, and some are not. The final question, what is your definition of success? Well, that's, that's too broad a question. Again, I'm afraid. Uh, I think there are, it's not a single definition that you either, okay, now I am successful, or now this is successful. I can consider uh, it's been a successful year if I get a new grant funded, I have four papers published, one of them in a good journal, I have attracted a really smart student into the lab and another smart student has gotten his PhD and gone off to do a really exciting postdoc um, and we've made a discovery that while it's not completely convincing has the potential five years down the road to be really exciting. If all of that happens in the same year, that's been kind of a good year. Well, it wasn't too broad because you answered it. 
Thank you very much. Sure. I really appreciate that. Good.